Teamwork makes the dream work, but sometimes it's a total nightmare. Hey leader, David Burgess here, organizational psychologist and author of five best-selling books on helping leaders and teams do their best work ever. Why teams? Well, because work is teamwork. For the majority of your professional life, you are gonna be asked to work on teams. Some of those teams are gonna be amazing, uplifting, exhilarating experiences, and but most of them are going to be either so-so or a colossal failure. Look, I taught in business school for over a decade. I know exactly what it feels like to have a team that just totally lets you down. And in this episode, we're gonna talk about why teams fail. We're gonna talk about why teams fail to achieve even the average of their expected performance based on knowledge, skills, and abilities. Some teams manage to achieve what in social science we call collective intelligence, where the intelligence of the team is actually greater than any individual person or even the high scorer or the average of everyone. They have what Stephen Covey might have called synergy. The whole really is smarter than the sum of everyone else. Most teams though, fail to achieve that collective intelligence. And when they do, that is a sign that the teamwork is failing. Now there's three specific reasons why teams fail to achieve collective intelligence and hence why teams fail overall. Let's dive into each one in turn and talk about how to reverse it. Let's get started. So the first reason teams fail is social loafing. This is the fancy psychology term for slackers. And we've all had slackers on our team, the people who don't really commit to anything or who do commit to things but don't really get held to a certain deadline, the people that always showed up unprepared for meetings and without the deliverables they either promised or left you with the impression that they promised and gave themselves a little bit of wiggle room. Social loafing is a phenomenon we've known about forever and highly collaborative tasks where divvying up the work is difficult, where divvying up who's responsible for what is difficult there are going to be people who take advantage of that in order to do less effort. There are going to be people who slack off because they know the team will carry them. How do you turn around social loafing? Well, the easiest way is accountability. You know, as I said, social loafing is going to happen on teams where work is so interdependent that it's hard to figure out who's responsible for what. So take the time to start figuring out who's responsible for what. Make sure on a regular basis on the team to be checking in it. Who's assigned with what? Who's actually delivering on those promises? Maybe you check in on a regular basis with what did I work on yesterday? What am I focused on today? Or maybe it's a weekly cycle. But the idea that on a regular basis, people have to report out to the whole team on here's what I committed to and here's what I completed is going to create less room for social loafers to strike. You can't necessarily change the personality. You may be able to change the individual motivation, but the surefire way to avoid social loafing is to remove the opportunity for social loafers, and you do that with accountability. The next reason teams fail is unequal sharing. Unequal sharing time, unequal turns speaking. This is sometimes in the literature referred to as conversational turn taking when it's the opposite teams that actually achieve collective intelligence, teams that actually do come up with greater performance than you would have predicted, are usually marked in their social dynamics with conversational turn-taking. Most people actually share at a roughly equal rate. And because most people share at a roughly equal rate, most ideas get out there. Most crazy ideas or new ways of doing things or, or the most information to make the most informed decision actually gets out there. And we've all been on a team where one or two people just totally over talk and dominate the meeting and what that's actually doing, while it may be giving them a chance to share their brilliance, is tampering down the brilliance of the team. Now, how do you solve this? Well, you might need more structure in your conversations. You might have to introduce rules around who can speak and how people are given the floor to speak. You might introduce timers, but the easiest and, and kind of least strict way that I tend to do it when I work with teams is I'll break a large team up into much smaller groups and give them time to talk. So maybe we have 20 minutes to talk about a particular problem. I'll take the first 10 and I'll say, you know, grab the person next to you and let's just talk our way through this. 
And after we bring people back, I ask to spend the next five to 10 minutes sharing out what happened in that group. That way each team has an opportunity. Now, one thing I haven't told you yet, I will never let two over talkers partner with each other. Why? Because what I want is for that overtalker to share his partner's or her partner's brilliance. I don't want them talking about them. Maybe they'll talk a little bit about them, but I also want them sharing what the other person said. And as a result, I know that if I do that, break a team of 10 into five pairs, I'm actually going to get to hear the opinions, the ideas, the information of all 10 people. And so while it's not perfect, it's not the perfect level of conversational turn taking you need to get to collective intelligence. It's a step in the right direction. And it's a preventative measure to keep the team from failing because over talkers are turning down its brilliance. Now, the last reason teams fail is a lack of social sensitivity. This is the ability in individuals to perceive the mental states, the beliefs, the emotions behind what other people are saying. This is how well we consider other people and how well we can empathize with other people. You know, one interesting thing researchers like Anita Williams Woolley have found is that groups that achieve collective intelligence just generally have more women in them. Just as a whole, the more women, the smarter the team. And this isn't necessarily attributable to IQ, it's directly attributable to social sensitivity. Women tend to score higher on tests of social sensitivity. They have higher levels of empathy than men tend to have. And yeah, I mean, one way to turn around this lack of social sensitivity would be to just add more women to the team. But another way might be taking steps to better get to know people and better understand their emotions, their behaviors, their personalities, so that you can empathize with them better. You're not going to turn this one around overnight. There's no little trick like partnering people up in pairs that will increase people's social sensitivity, but you can model behavior and teach empathy. You could talk about your emotions, talk about your beliefs. When you are advocating for a decision, don't just lay it out logically. Humans are rarely actually logical, by the way. Lay it out logically plus talk about your emotions and maybe that increases other people's willingness to talk about their emotions and our ability to perceive each other's behavior, each other's statements and each other's stated emotions and eventually start to learn the other members of our team as well as we know ourselves. And over time, that increases that sense of social sensitivity which will increase our overall collective intelligence and keep us from failing. Yeah, I know what you're thinking it's probably easier just to add more women to your team. Trust your instincts. So if you look at all three of these and you think about your failures that you've experienced on teams that you just dreaded being a part, whether it was social loafing or never being able to get a word in edgewise or just the fact that the team had zero empathy for each other, you can see that most of the time teams fail because they lack collective intelligence. And that's bad news for the moment, but that's good news for leaders and highly influential teammates because means is if we focus in on building that collective intelligence, if we focus in on the empathy and social skills and the pro-social behaviors around our team, we can take the existing team we have now and make them smarter. We can take the existing knowledge, skills, abilities, and performance we have now and make it better, make it less likely to fail, and maybe even make it a team where people think they could do their best work ever. Oh, and one more thing. These are ways to failure proof your team, but there's still ways we can go in increasing collaboration. So if you want to follow up, if you want to dive deeper, you're going to want to check out this video here on how to foster collaboration on teams.